I want to share a story with you quickly that happened five years ago. I was sitting at the office, um, still the burger, we work now, we all work now for a, a, a network for in 20. But it was late one evening, I don't know why I was still there, but yeah, it happens. And somebody called me to the phone and said, said this one is for you. And the person on the other line said, I'm going to be more fam famous than Chris Barnard. And immediately I thought, okay. <laughs> the BS detector tick box, tick number one. And he said to me, um, and we are going to make a person who is a paraplegic walk. And I said, how? And he said, I'm going to transplant stem cells. And I said, and he said, I'm going to be so famous, I'm going to give the scoop to you. And that was like 10 ticks more on my little list. And I said, what's your name? And he said, well, he's a neurosurgeon. I thought, okay. And I said, okay, first of all, before I talk further, can you please give me the peer review paper in which you published your breakthrough? And he said, no, 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 no. It's going to be published all over in Heiskenert and in the Argus and in Bucknell Burger and everywhere. And I said, no, no, I didn't say I'm going to publish it. And it started actually a horrible sequence of events for me, personally, about this neurosurgeon who did, in fact, illegally and against all ethical practices, did do an operation in a hospital in Cape Town without any, any clinical experience no ethical review, nothing on a person in a private hospital. Um, I did entertain him for the first day to obtain all the information, and he said, yes, the person that, who, who concocted the stem cell um, concoction is a, another doctor, and I said, well, give me his name, and he said, yeah, he's a veterinarian. <laughs> After all, this man was not even a veterinarian. He had a BA in agricultural sciences. After I checked with all the, um, with all the universities. But the, the more I delved into the story of this doctor, who was in fact registered at the Health Professions Council of this country, um, and I contacted the hospital, I said, can I get the eth ethics committee's names and the ethical review and the clinical test? The hospital gave me, ga did give me a letter and they say, said, this is the evidence of the ethical review and it was actually basically just a letter. It was said, so-and-so can operate in this hospital and big letters, but we want media coverage. That is the prerequisite for doing this operation. And um, the, the veterinarian was found guilty years before for animal abuse. He ha did experiments in his garage on monkeys. Um, the whole backlash of this was this Professor Anton van Ikaak, who helped me with the ethical procedures and the, the stuff that went wrong. I wrote 15 articles about this. I went to the Health Professions Council. Nothing happened. Um, I went to the South African College of Neurosurgeons. Um, they would complained. Um, the Department of Health eventually did not respond to anything. It, up to a point that there was a conference in Cape Town, I knew the minister was going to be there. I printed everything out, gave it into his hands. I walked through the security, wanted to arrest me, gave it to him and said, look at this an illegal operation, and he's going to do the next one. Nothing happened. Um, and then I went to the MEC of the time and said, this happened. A person was operated on. He claims he will walk again. He still can't walk. It was absolutely a bogus operation. I don't know what, in, what was in the stem cells. And he said, we'll look into it. Then two years later, the same MEC, I, I met the same MEC at another event, and he said, do you want to know why I didn't support you? Then. I said, yes, please do tell me. I said, we wanted to wait. If a man could walk again, we're going to hail it as a breakthrough for this province. And if he couldn't, well, then nothing, nothing happened. The backlash of it was that everybody attacked me to, to say that I took the man's last hope away because 
if this procedure didn't work, what harm was done? And um, what harm can be done? But that was not the point. And with all the articles that I wrote, with all the support of the professors and the doctors, nobody understood that it's unethical. This wasn't tested medicine. It wasn't proper tested in medicine. So that was the outcome of that. Eventually, it was such a horrible experience for me that I haven't done such a story since. Um, yeah, that was just the way, even the way you communicate the, 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 the science. And if you tell people exactly that this is unethical, this should have been an ethical procedure, people say, well, he's, he's a paraplegic in any case, what harm was said to be done? Well, I don't know if you can recall this story. Well, the start of the Bavard particle, we know about um, Peter Hicks and Francis Inglot and their theory and why the God particle exists or what they perceived as uh, that it possessed, uh, existed. And it, it's the God particle gives us why um, uh, particles have mass and the, the, the frame the God, uh, the God particle. Leon Liederman and who said it's a goddamn particle. So we all waited for this big announcement. Now this was, I think, probably one of the worst days that I've experienced because they gave us this wonderful, terrible press release. Now, um, I don't know if you can make sense of this. Maybe if you're a professor of um, physics. So we read it over and over and over. We've, we know it must be a boson, and it's the heaviest boson we've ever found. But they didn't actually <laughs> see that day they found the Higgs boson. But you can read the full, you should actually go and read the full miscommunication uh, press release that was, that was given that day. And then I love the, the, the second one from, from the bottom. It's hard not to get excited by these results. Now that was... <laughs> Since um, they found the double helix, the most understated one ever. So that day we all sat, and I phoned other journalists, I phoned um, Hendrik Geyer, so was it found or not? And it led to such misunderstanding and miscommunication in the media that I've ever seen. They should have made it just like, with the Nobel Prize, they give the layman's version, and then the scientific version, and it's so much easier. You understand the Nobel Prize um, press releases and the press pack that they give. Everybody can make a story from that, not from, from this. And these are the, some of the beauties that was came from it. I, I specifically like, now mother of God particle discovered. I, I like that. But that one, Proof of the God particle found, suck on, on that atheist. <laughs> the, the independent one was, was fine, but the way that the, the God particle was not explained where the name came from by the majority of people who reported fueled into this misunderstanding of what it actually was. But, um, yeah, I, the mother of God one, I've kept that. It's, I love it. Um, the next slide is how we covered it. And the sub-editor decided to say 99.9% sure. But even when I wrote that article, I still didn't, knew, didn't know because we couldn't figure out after they put that press release out. Only in a follow-up article did we know, oh, it was found. But did we explain it? And that's where we should, because CERN would say, well, our press release is fine. Other scientists understand it. Did we explain it? The context of the God particle. Um, it's the same as the ever persistent Big Bang. Do we explain the science properly? And it, it's the same with GMOs and stem cells and cloning and genetics and organ transplants and <coughs> clinical studies and vaccines. We always assume when we come 
proper science journalists that people understand the background. You only need a paragraph. And the, the big, my big fight is always with the GMOs and the history and the context and the time that might have elapsed since we've started with it. That cloning is basically, it's done. And, and genetics is the same. The way that um, stem cells are, are researched these days. Now, I have a particular picture that I hate. Is Yuri, Yuri, are you here? Yeah. Yuri, I'm sorry about the next slide. Because I know... I sue you. <laughs> sue me, it's okay. Because Harris is here today, and I was the journalist who was nearly sued with him because of so, 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 so low, and vitamin D or something. But what happened with so low was they... <laughs> They advertised with us, and after I wrote a column, they refused to pay their huge advertising bill. I just left it to the lawyers and the advertising people, but yeah. Because I'm so sorry, because I know this image is on the cover of your book, but I absolutely hate this image, and I see it all over. Because this is the thing that we, we're responsible for fueling, why are they still apes? And that it's linear, that evolution is linear, and it, it went like this. And it isn't punctuated, and that, that evolution happened vastly different for this. I know it's an easy image to use, but we shouldn't use it. I don't use it, and I, I've banned it. I don't want to see it. I hate it. <laughs> I know hate is a strong word, but I hate it, because this image fuels the, the way people perceive evolution. And it's a, our duty as science journalists and surely as scientists to get rid of this image, maybe to call Google and say, remove it. And um, the other word I hate and that I don't use because it, I think it's my duty as a science journalist to convey, the, convey messages and to choose words very carefully, like embryonic stem cells. If you then use the word, explain the word embryonic that it's not some dead baby, because people think that. Put it in the correct context. The other one is missing link. So this is a wonderful, wonderful fossil that was found. We all know the Talek, but missing link. The typical reaction that I would get, because I write for a typical um, audience, and the phone calls and the stuff, is that, Oh, so you haven't had it? Now you got it. No, so what? Or oh, this is the end of the scientific process. So where does it, does it fit in? I just don't use the word missing link or for Mr. Scarpe or, or whatever because there isn't such a thing. I believe that it's a big puzzle that we have and that you add to the puzzle or if the, if the block doesn't fit, you just remove it. But to think that there's a missing link the typical reaction is that so, so then Darwin was wrong. They were still looking for something. We forever, scientists are forever looking for new pieces of information. That's why I love the term blue sky science. It's the curiosity and the wonder. So this is it. We should work around this image. Um, it's the same as words in, in paleontology that we often find. So in 2008, the um, wonderful Sediba fossil was found, and there was a huge press conference, and it was all an embargo, and it was in, in April 2010 that the Sediba fossil was announced. So we all were sitting there, and everybody likes to be on TV, and TV gets preference, and um, so we have a um, live broadcast. And the whole nation is watching ETV. And Jeremy Maggs, he's got the first question. And he asks, so is this the missing link? And he asked that to Professor um, Lieberger. I'm, I thought I'm, I, I'm going to die on the spot. After we heard the whole presentation about what Sadiba is, it's not a missing link. So when Omen Aleri was announced, the first time is, who, what got the most publicity? Not all the wonderful features that was done. It was this man who said that he is not, um, he, no one will dig up old monkey bones 
and um, that he isn't a, a relationship of, of, a, of a baboon. But how did we write that? How did we respond to it? So what, what happened in our office was, when Amal Aledi was the first um, uh, announced, uh, I traveled there and I sat in this, uh, who of you, be, of, you, uh, of you have been to um, the Cradle of Humankind? Did you notice that there's virtually no um, cell phone and wireless communication? So um, I sat there with a Dropbox link and it took me about three hours to download the stuff and we made a wonderful, wonderful presentation and I thought we're going to explain everything. We built a whole mini website and everything. I was so excited. It's going to be on the front page of Berger and Bild and Volkspart and it's our first online multimedia package. And then he said this and this was on the front page. Um, this was, it was not a good morning for me when I arrived at the, at the, at the O Octombo. But what they should have done was just then put in a bit of context. But this made the, the headlines, and nobody was there to counter, to counter what, what he said. Um, should it be news? Yes, it should be news. But then you should have a person explaining it. Um, and this is actually the best picture I found for for this old thing that crops up beneath every article I write about every illusion, because there's always a person who say, "So oh, why are these still monkeys?" Um, I like this um, infographic. Infographics are very powerful to explain complex stuff to people, and then you just leave it. I don't um, engage in the. It's a. It's a, a a um, gentleman from the, the New York Times store here. Because I wanted to tell him he, he had a mountain lion, but I once had a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this one, one person tells me, there's a mermaid on the beach with teeth. <laughs> and normally I just say, go away, I don't listen to this. And then the second caller came in to say, there's an alien on Musenberg. And I thought, okay, let's go and have a look. Eventually, it was just a very, very decayed sea lion. But, yeah, so we have mermaids with teeth. So are we responsible of fueling this whole fire of, of misinformation? Um, this was an interesting one. It resonated quite a long time. Do you remember this? Who of you remember Darwin was wrong on two occasions? What this New Scientist article actually said, it's not a tree, it's a bush, but we know. But this popped up all over the world, especially the New Scientist one, in creationist website, in creation ministries. I know it's a wonderful site, creation ministry. If you want to spoil your day, <coughs> to go and Google and see what they, what they write. It's been used to this day that, Dar see, Darwin was wrong. It was the same as a God particle. He said, atheists suck on this. There's a God particle. Um, when, you, when you read this, these articles, I, 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 I view this as sensationalist, without the proper context, because people just see this. Um, so we are feeling a lot of, of, of these, these myths. Um, the other thing that we do also feel, um, especially in, in when our big stories break, is regarding mental health. You, we still see all of these words being, being used, um, especially in Afrikaans media, but all over. And the one thing that I've always watched closely when there are these huge terror, terrorism attacks or um, people driving into, uh, um, people walking on the sidewalk, or uh, that, that crime and terrorism are being linked with mental illness. It might be true, but I've, I've still to see a CNN or B, a BBC program to try to get a psychiatrist or psychologist or some expert to explain this, to say, is it pathological? Or is it not? But these words are being constantly used in the media 
to explain violent behavior. So are they psychiatrically ill or is it something else? Is it fueled by religion? Is it fueled by something else? But I've never, I've seldom seen a balance in reporting when it comes to mental health, especially <coughs> when it's linked to some kind of mass murder or, or terrorism attack. Well, fake news. In science, we've had it all along. It's a recent thing in other, in, in, in other media or other beats like politics or so-and-so is dead. We've had it for years. We just didn't call it fake news. We call it pseudoscience. Because you can look at all these things and people, people believe it. I sit on Facebook constantly and all I do is I never want to see this post. You know that wonderful thing that you can, you can do? You don't want to see this again. Because we have this. We know that there are, might be properties of, of cannabis that can help with pain relief, but now it cures cancer. Um, years ago when I was um, small, I read the and there was this guy who, 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 who swore, swore by it that if you ate apricot kernels, it cures cancer. Lo and behold, I wrote a British Medical Journal of a guy that ate so much apricot kernel and he had the, um, the, uh, the homeopathic, no, it was not a homeopathic, it was an alternative medicine that he used, a concoction that he ended up in hospital and he, he got so sick, it was toxic. So it's, <laughs> it's actually true that um, these medicines are um, bad for one if it's untested. I couldn't believe that I found the, uh, an article of a person that actually poisoned himself with apricot kernels because of untested, um, ineffective and unsafe medicines or so-called medicines. Well, we have, we, have, we have this vaccine free, is healthy, caring, and wise. The thing I try to stay away from are the anti vaccines because they will drive me insane. Um, you cannot, I, I can't, I, 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 I try not to engage with them. Um, genetically modified um, stuff, you see this all, um, all over. Um, yeah, and stems, people don't understand the stem cells, but vaccines, are, I, I, I write straightforward articles and I don't engage because, um, however, there was the, measles, the constant measles outbreaks that we have here. Um, I do want to scare people and tell them about the, the negative things. Um, but pseudoscience, who's to blame? Um, I think there are huge interest groups who, who feel pseudoscience and they know it. Uh, there was a study that came out to prove that the anti-vaccine groups are of the biggest groups that, that who, who fuel the anti-vaccine campaign, who, who benefit from people not having vaccines. I don't know, maybe sciences, um, science education, and maybe in the media, the editors, it's not so much the science journalists. I think um, one is a bit of an island if you sit in a newsroom and sometimes people don't understand what you're doing. Um, there are incidents that you try to explain what you, what you do is not always cool and it's not always sexy and that every story don't, doesn't need to be a breakthrough. Because breakthroughs, as you know, in science are few and far between, like gravitational waves, now that was a breakthrough. But that you, have, you need to explain to your, your editor that what I, is this new, is it already available? No, it's a clinical trial, but it's really cool, and it will only be, it might be available in 10 years, but this is cool. So how do you explain to your editor um, the benefits of, of a story uh, such as that? And the, the other thing is when it comes to, um, Astronomy is why should we care about something out there? Um, it's a it's a difficult thing, and what's the benefit for us? Uh, so it's it's a really hard thing to to try and 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 sell. So how far is it? Yeah, well, um, 200 million light years, and, but I don't say it will take us 200 million years to get there, um, but at the speed of light. So it's, then it would even be more hard to sell the story. 
but it's sometimes um, internally a, a hard, a hard thing to sell. Um, I, 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 I don't only do science journalism; I do the medical and sometimes some environmental stories as well. Um, maybe we should go back to the basics um, to understand the scientific process. Um, journalism. <coughs> It's a bit of an educa uh, educator, um, and the thing that I always try to stress in my articles or when I talk to people is that a theory and a hypothesis, that it's not the same thing, and I think that's where th things go uh, haywire, when you try to, to, to say, well, no, evolution is just a theory, just, uh, you know, and the, 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 the evolution, the bush and the branches, and um, that science is an eternal puzzle. And that's also where I, I, I have um, bad interactions with people that they say, but you see again, now there's another poll. So which poll is the correct one? Or you see, this is, this is now unproven, but I know that this works. And why isn't it 100%? When, it, when, it, when we report, we should put emphasis on the fact that to bring in the scientific method in your, in your journalism, without being academic, it, it should be a, a type of narrative to explain the scientific method without it sounding like an explanation. You, it's, it's, it's possible to do. Well, it's a breakthrough, a word that I try not to, not to use, um, or this is it. It's few and far between. And then the whole idea that science corrects itself, <coughs> to try and put it into every article in a small little way to uh, and, uh, understand that this is an everlasting big puzzle that we're building and it's busy evolving and it's never, there's no, never an ultimate truth. Uh, and one can build it in, in, your, in your stories and you can build it into the way you ask questions. Thank you. Thank you.